Hello and welcome to this lecture in the series Imperial Power and the Roman World. I'm Hannah Marie Chidwick. I'm a lecturer in Classics and Ancient History at the University of Bristol. And what interests me most in studying the Roman world is war. Not strategies or weaponry necessarily, but the way that people in the ancient world and today tell stories about war, what we choose to tell, and what happens to the bodies embroiled in those stories. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about today in this lecture about imperial power and the soldierly body in Latin epic, particularly the Roman poet Lucan's epic, Civil War. War was always important in Roman politics. During the Republican period, from about the 6th century BCE to the mid 1st century BCE, going to war was essential for any Roman man who wanted a political career. And once enlistment in the army was opened up to all Roman male citizens beyond the elite, regardless of wealth or status, and that happened around the beginning of the 1st century BCE, war became a means of social mobility. The life of a soldier, although gruelling and dangerous, was nevertheless sometimes preferable to a life working the land as a peasant. For the political elite, being seen as an effective military commander, being admired by your soldiers and bringing home plenty of spoils and captives from your campaigns, guaranteed the support of the Roman populace. One of the most notorious examples of a military general who used his uh, success in war for political gain is, of course, Gaius Julius Caesar. And Caesar is the central character in the poem that I'm going to talk about today. This lecture will examine the representation of war in Lucan's epic Civil War, sometimes called the Pharsalia, uh, after the climactic battle at Pharsalus in central Greece, in 48 BCE, a battle which decided the war in favour of Julius Caesar over the Republic. And his victory led to Caesar's dictatorship and subsequent assassination in 44 BCE. Lucan's poem was written during the imperial period, the time after the death of Caesar and the Principate of Augustus, from around the first century CE onwards. Lucan was writing during the turbulent rule of the Emperor Nero. And I'll talk a bit more about the relationship between Lucan and Nero uh, in just a moment, because knowing about the poem's political context, while not at all necessary, it, it can provide us with some interesting avenues for interpretation for its representation of war and imperial power. Lucan's poem follows the course of the war from its declaration at the moment when Caesar crossed the Rubicon River in 49 BCE, through numerous battles and skirmishes and mutinies, to the death of Caesar's rival Pompey Magnus, and eventually the poem ends with Caesar trapped in Egypt seeking reinforcements. So in this lecture, we'll examine how the soldiers depicted in Lucan's poem embody the evils of conflict in the name of autocracy. This wild, gruesome poem has often been interpreted as a tirade against one man rule and the horrors of civil war. It is no wonder that Lucan begins his poem by crying out, quis furor oquies, what madness was this, citizens of Rome? In her introduction to a translation of the poem, Susanna Braun describes how most of the deaths in the poem are striking for their strangeness, suddenness, and lack of dignity and heroism. Lucan is not concerned to glamorise death. On the contrary, his descriptions convey the full force of horror through their graphic detail. The total wrongness of civil war is reflected in the strangeness of its course. Now Lucan's text 
is indeed a poem in the tradition of Latin epic poetry, but it is quite a singular text, one which interweaves poetry with history, science, truth and fiction, and which plays with techniques inherited from Lucan's epic predecessors. Um, famous poets like Virgil, wrote the Aeneid, or Ovid, wrote the Metamorphoses, so before we start to analyse the particular way in which Lucan depicts his soldiery, let's learn a little bit more about Lucan himself and think about when and how his poem was written. So who was Lucan? Uh, Marcus Annius Lucanus, or Lucan, uh, was born in 39 CE to a wealthy family in Cordoba, in Spain. Uh, he was raised and educated in Rome, where he began a minor political career. You might have heard of the philosopher Seneca the Younger. Seneca was Lucan's uncle. He was also tutor to the Emperor Nero, who had been ruling the Roman Empire since the death of his uncle Claudius in 54 CE, when Nero was just 17 years old. These were very uncertain times for Rome. The Julio-Claudian line, uh, of which Nero was a part, had come to power through a military coup on the part of Augustus, roughly a century earlier, uh, and his successors were not famed for their personal or political stability. The empire itself was still expanding, taking territory across Europe, North Africa, and into the Near East. An imperial power was now manifested as the rule of one man, whom we now call the emperor, but the Romans would have called Caesar, uh, amongst other names. Contemporary historians also tell us that, interestingly, free speech was severely limited amongst the governing elite, painting an atmosphere of tension and fear in the imperial court. Only people in the emperor's inner circle could hope to have any real influence in the upper echelons of Roman politics. And for a short time, Lucan was a member of that circle. He wrote for the Roman elite. He was reportedly a prolif prolific poet, even though we only have most of his work in tiny fragments or mentions. In 60 CE, he won a grand poetry competition with a poem in praise of Nero. Out of this period of uncertainty was born a new style of Latin poetry, one infused with hyperbolic rhetoric, sententiae, uh, short, pithy phrases conveying a striking thought, and excessive violence. Lucan was recognised in his time as a poet full of fire and energy, and his style, with a strong streak of what we would now call the Gothic, was imitated by his successors like Statius, like Valerius Flaccus, uh, and he has been admired throughout the centuries by many other poets like Percy Shelley, for example. But by the time Lucan had published the first books of his epic, The Civil War, in around 63 CE, Nero had banned Lucan from ever reciting his poetry in public again. A prime example of the renowned unpredictability of the Julio-Claudians uh, that I was talking about earlier. We don't know exactly why Lucan was forbidden from performing his poetry, but it may have had something to do with a personal rivalry, perhaps, between Lucan and Nero. The emperor rather fancied himself as an artist and a performer, and reputedly did not like to be bested. But this may simply be the fabrication of later Roman historians like Tacitus, who did not hold the Julio-Claudians in particularly high regard. Lucan responded to the embargo on his expression by joining a conspiracy to assassinate Nero. The plot was unsuccessful. Lucan was found out and, in time-honoured Roman tradition, was forced to commit suicide. He was 26. Civil War was only 10 books long and many scholars believe was unfinished. Death, especially suicide, ferocity, power and rage against silence are themes throughout Lucan's epic. 
he rails at the Roman people for wasting their strength by turning their swords into Awiskera, into their own guts. Lucan was living through the repercussions of the war that he was narrating. It was unusual in Roman poetry at the time to write about such recent history. Authors like Virgil had mostly concerned themselves with mythology or events centuries past, but Lucan's text concerned a war still very vivid in the Roman imagination. Lucan describes the subject of his poem as wars worse than civil, and legality conferred on crime. War, thought throughout his poem, is described as nefas, a Latin word meaning crime, but specifically meaning unspeakable, an unspeakable crime. As the scholar Eka Willis describes in Civil War, the sovereign, in this case, the emperor, the successor to Julius Caesar, is not the founder hero of the epic, but the winner of an illegal war the biggest criminal to emerge from a crime of cosmic proportions. Civil conflict was something so horrifying to the Romans that some believe that after Caesar's assassination, the Roman populace accepted autocracy simply to avoid it happening again. Throughout his poem, Lucan has a tendency to delay his narrative, to repeat, to openly state in some cases that he does not wish to continue writing, or that he does, as though he's trying to prevent the conflict from happening in his own story, as though doing so might mean the conflict never happened at all, and that the imperial rule to which he himself was subject and victim might never come to be. Just before the Battle of Pharsalus in Book 7 of the Civil War, he says, Here is the fury, the madness, the crimes of Caesar. Let my mind flee from this part of the war and relinquish it to darkness. Little did Lucan know that just three years after his death in 65 CE, civil war would break out in Rome once more with another military coup and the suicide of Nero. As such, Lucan's epic has long been read as raging against the imperial machine. It also rages against many conventions of Latin poetry, particularly in its presentation of war. Civil War is a poem violent to a degree shared but not rivaled by other Roman writers of his time, writes Shadi Bach. The epic has no heroes as well. Caesar and his political rival Pompey are the protagonists, but they are certainly not depicted as heroic. Caesar is a force of monstrous war, likened to a lightning bolt. And speaking of thunder and lightning, the poem also shuts out intervention by divine figures. Now, anybody who's read the Aeneid or knows of Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey, you will know that the gods play significant roles in the story. They do not in Lucan's epic. In Civil War, men alone are responsible for the atrocities that Lucan narrates. At Pharsalus, the poet tells his readers, there are assuredly no gods above us. And he later adds, no mortals were ever cared for by a god. In the first book of his poem, however, Lucan includes a dedication to a godlike figure for the Romans, the Emperor Nero. Many scholars surmise that either he wrote this part of the poem before the indictment against him, or it is simply satirical. Let Pharsalia fill her terrible plains with the dead, he writes. Rome is indebted to civil war because it was done for you. It is hard not to read this as perhaps sarcasm, given the brutality that follows. I mentioned that Lucan has a tendency to repeat. Let me do the same. He especially repeats words relating to horror and war. Words like sanguis and cadavera, blood and corpses. Words hardly used at all by his poetic predecessors because they are more associated with medical writing than high art. He is bringing warfare down to earth. 
This is just one of the ways in which Lucan's poem shows us the evils of war through the way that he writes about the body. Most Roman narratives of war tend to prioritise the strategizing of army generals or the exploits of a few heroic individuals, usually high-ranking soldiers like centurions. But Roman authors preferred to showcase pitched battles, brave men fighting brave men in an orderly venture to victory. Yet in Lucan's poem, the battle scenes are disorderly. They are dense and bloody and difficult to follow. The armies fight in a great mass of bodies and body parts, and Lucan does not shy away from describing in graphic detail the injuries dealt and sustained by his combatants. As in this example from his, his version of the, the Battle of Pharsalus, he says, It is shameful to dwell on tears for the innumerable dead at the death of the world, or to follow individual fates asking through whose innards did the wounding sword pierce, who trampled on his own spilt vitals, who, with a face to his opponent, thrust out the sword sunk in his throat, dying with his breath, who falls together with one blow. We can interpret this passage and many others like it in Lucan's poem as signalling how much death and destruction happens in the name of the imperial system. So many bodies are killed in war that Lucan concludes, no singular death deserves lament. There is not time to mourn individuals. But what he does do, using the powers invested in him as poet, is tell us about the injuries suffered by the civil warring combatants. He asks, whose innards did the wounding sword pierce? Who trampled on his own spilt vitals? Civilian men are not named. They are not preserved here as individuals, but they, instead they are dismembered in the way their fates are recounted. They are reduced to throats, swords and viscera, a mass of warring bodies all falling together with one blow. There is a kind of dark thread of humour in the grotesquerie of Lucan's poem, which serves to highlight the horror of the situation through sublimity. You can see in just this short passage how death in civil war, the poem and the reality, is not glamorous or heroic. Lucan cries out to Rome, how long a period is enough for posterity to forget and forgive the losses of your wars? The poet is ensuring that his generation, at least, will remember them. By thinking specifically then about the body in Lucan's poem, we can start to create new interpretations of the way imperial power functions in literature. We can see the impact of conflict at the level of the individual humans involved in it. For us as 21st century readers, Lucan's violence is particularly evocative because we are living in an age post-World Wars, post-Vietnam, an age when the visceral realities of war are well known to us through the media. Some of us have even experienced them personally. So the brutality and horror in Lucan's poem seems, ironically, more palatable to us, perhaps, in contrast to the ancient narratives which glorify war as something valorous and heroic in service to the, to the nation. Dulcet decorum est, wrote the poet Horace, just a few decades before Lucan, pro patria mori, it is pleasing and proper to die for your country, for your imperial ruler. Lucan, perhaps, is showing us what that really means. The violence of Lucan's civil war leads Joy Connolly to describe the poem itself as a direct participant in imperial reality. Thank you for listening. <laughs>